mobile type Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Um, so my name is Judith Orban. I'm a physiotherapist and also a Schroth therapist. And before I introduce myself, uh, we're going to um, just quickly do a review of what we're going to do today. So the presentation will be about an hour, maybe a little bit longer. And after that, I will give you plenty of time for Q questions and answers. Probably not going to reach 30 minutes because I prepared so many slides, uh, but feel free to type in your questions during or after the presentation because maybe questions might pop up when we talk about a specific topic um, and you don't want to forget your questions. And, but there will be a handout and recording available after session. And I would like to know that this presentation cannot and should not replace any advice from your healthcare professionals who are treating you, knowing you know you well. So if you feel that something may be wrong, you should seek professional help for assessment and treatment. And this information for guidance only, and is not intended to provide or replace an individual medical advice. And so take it with caution. Okay, so um, as I said, I'm a physiotherapist. I work at Diane Lee Associates Physiotherapy Clinic here in South Surrey. And I have a special clinical interest treating people with connective tissue disorders, uh, specifically Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, hypermobility spectrum disorders, Marfan Syndrome, and as it comes in hand in hand, uh, complex pain conditions and persistent pain conditions. Um, what brought me to this topic is uh, that I've been working for over a decade uh, with idiopathic spinal conditions such as scoliosis and kyphosis, as well as chest conditions such as pectus carinatum, pectus excavatum. And throughout my practice as a young physio, I bumped into a lot of hypermobile folks and I started learning more and more about it. And it turns out that a lot of people who have scoliosis also have hypermobility. And this is how my attention started to draw more towards um, this patient population, as well as spinal surgeries from starting to minimal invasive all the way to the complex spinal surgeries. And then degenerative spinal conditions. It gives me a lot of joy treating people who has a lot of back pain and all kinds of degenerative changes to figure out how can we move forward and how can we how can we get better, feel better. So I see a lot of patients with compression fractures, spondylolisthesis, lateral listhesis, and also spinal stenosis and sometimes two more resection surgeries. Um, so a quick summary from the previous webinar, because some of you were not here and uh, asked about, like, can we do a quick recap? And so this is for you guys. <laughs> so just a quick review. I'm a physiotherapist, which means I'm a registered healthcare professional. I specialize in how the human body moves and anything that is related to that. I treat people who have pain, such as and weakness and, and strength issues and other health conditions, injuries, disabilities. We help through physical rehabilitation and we also work with injury prevention and, and the health and fitness. Uh, we are primary healthcare providers, so it means no referrals are required to see a physiotherapist, although sometimes it's necessary to have a, a referral because your insurance might cover it if you are referred by your GP. So during a physiotherapy treatment, a physiotherapist learns about your medical history assesses and diagnoses your condition, provide a treatment plan that helps set goals for you, provide education on your health, suggest assistive devices, and then moving forward, prescribes exercises or performs manual treatment and modalities. And after that, monitoring your progress, modifying your treatment plan just as needed. And also we keep written records and communicate with others involved in your care, all the way from your OT to your RMT to your lawyer and your special um, uh, uh, specialists. Um, so after uh, this topic, we talked about uh, HEDS and related care and problems around um, the treatment uh, of HEDS. And I love this quote from Dr. Gabor Mate, diagnosis describes things, it doesn't explain things. So it's really important that um, we don't just look at the label that you receive, but we look at the human behind that label and treat it accordingly, treat them accordingly. Um, so when we do physiotherapy for just like 
Ehlers-Danlos diagnosis, not necessarily for the for the person behind. These are the conditions that we receive on referral notes or from other uh, reports, medical diagnostics. So there are peripheral joints and muscle conditions. I'm sure most of you very, very familiar with this whole bubble over here. And then we see lots of spinal conditions, mental health problems, pelvic health related conditions, and multi-system conditions. As you can see, there's many things, many symptoms, many conditions that are, arise in a physiotherapy setting so it's important that we prioritize and we make sure that we work on your meaningful goals, meaningful complaints. Um, after that, we talked about patient-centered care um, in the management of hypomyal illness down syndrome. And it's really important that you're aware of how you're feeling and you're tracking it maybe with a chronic pain journal or you're just actively listening to your body on a daily basis and not only when it hurts or not only when there's a bigger problem, but you're actively checking in with your body and um, tracking it as well in order to help managing flares and crashes. Because once you identify your flare patterns and acute triggers, it can really help you make a better decision on how to manage them best and where to reach out, reach for help. Um, we also talked about managing fatigue, myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic, chronic fatigue syndrome, and post-exertional malaise, um, tips for conserving energies, minimizing symptoms, such as pacing or decreasing the stimulation, modifying your school or your work life, and using assisted devices and health aids. So it's all in all, it's important that we consider the diagnosis and focus on the meaningful complaint. And what is this meaningful complaint? So in the integrated systems model that I use as an approach for my patients, um, it's important that we determine what is the task that hurts and then what is the driver for it. And this is different when you have constant persistent pain versus when you bend forward, you have pain or when you do a specific joint movement that hurts. But for example, let's say you can't sit because you have pain going down in your legs. So this is your meaningful task, a movement or a posture that is chosen for evaluation and is often related to the location of pain, but often, but rather to the activity. So we want to check what is that function, what is that activity that you want to improve versus I have pain in my leg. If we just look at your leg, we might miss the whole point. So then we can find better the driver, the region of the body or mind or both that when corrected improves the experience or the performance for a task. So changing the position, let's say of your pelvis, resolves a tension in your joints and releases tension also on the sciatic nerve. So your pelvis is the driver, your meaningful task is sitting and the location, the source of pain is in the leg because it is the sciatic nerve. Um, so today we're going to uh, continue the topic and uh, managing hypermobility. We're going to talk a lot about exercises. And so first I prepared a little bit of um, a review on hypermobility, subluxation, what is exercise, what is pain. So there will be a lot of fun learning ahead. So according to the ehlers Donald Society, the way HEDS is managed is in two aspects. One is physical therapy and the other is pain management. And the way they recommend to do it is by addressing the symptoms a person is experiencing. So you can see a little bit of a discrepancy what I just told you one slide ago that I'm not necessarily managing the pain, I'm trying to manage the function that you would like to improve and hoping and pretty much what happen, happens is that your pain will uh, gets better with it because if you can do a pain-free or a better movement, your pain will get better as well. So everyone with HEDS has different primary symptoms. So it and oftentimes it requires multiple healthcare providers in different specialities working on their own care plan to meet their individual needs. So I like to use physiotherapy for HEDS patient or client is a better word than patient um, versus for a diagnosis. And we broke this down. This is another slide from our previous session, how I like to focus on prevention of secondary complications when things are going well, management of your symptoms or things are 
acutely not going super well. And then halt progression, slowing lung disease progression, if you already have consequences of your hypermobility. So here are from another great picture from the Ehlers Danlos Society, how symptoms present on a wide spectrum. So on the colors of this color spectrum, you can have not just um, like throughout your life, you're always going to have joint instability, autonomic dysfunction, and headaches. But I think even day to day, your symptoms pretty much can look very, very different. So someday you wake up and you might not have any pain, but you have a lot of fatigue and um, gut issues and you have migraines. But then the next day you don't have much pain, you don't have much fatigue, but you have a lot of anxiety. So it's important that we understand how it's, it's not like I have a torn ACL and it's going to be very predictable going through the rehabilitation, but it's going to be on a quite wide range. The color palette is going to be different each session. So I like this hypermobility spectrum, uh, how two different people with hypermobility may experience very, very different symptoms. So one person, again, can have significant joint instability and headaches and some anxiety and lots and lots of symptoms of mast cell activation syndrome, while the other person primarily having gut problems and autonomic dysfunction, like high heart rate and symptoms, again, of mast cell activation syndrome. Uh, so let's now talk a little bit in more details about hypermobility and pain. So what causes joint hypermobility? And some of you might be very well aware, especially from uh, lots of previous wonderful webinars, what it is. But let's just break it down from my perspective, from movement perspective. So hypermobility in HEDS is genetically determined changes to the type of protein called collagen. This collagen is found throughout the body in our connective tissues, such as our skin, our tendons, our ligaments, and joint capsule. And if this collagen is weaker than it should be, tissues in the body will be more fragile, which can make ligaments and joints too loose, too stretchy. And as a result, your joints are extending further than usual. So we can identify this. Your doctor, your physiotherapist, even your occupational therapist can evaluate your joints using a tool called the goniometer, and um, for with further assessment, that's more for the general hypermobility. But some people need further, such as your neck, upper neck instability is a very common, uh, unfortunate condition as well with joint hypermobilities. And we can't use a goniometer for that. We really have to specifically check one or two ligaments with certain tests where we specify I'm holding your C2, your cervical second vertebra, and I move your cranium or your C1 around it, and I just check the ligamentous stability of that area. But all in all, we can, uh, we can diagnose it and we can fill out the checklist for um, the um, Bison hypermobility scale. There's many other um, scientifically approved joint hypermobility tests, but as you can see, Again, it's not might not be your leading problem, might not be um, generalized, might be just a peripheral joint. So let's say it impacts only your hand and feet. I have many clients who are really having ankle issues and related knee hip issues because they only have their feet hypermobile. Um, and it also could be localized. For example, I myself have a localized joint hypermobility. So I can at any given day bend forward and put my elbows down on the ground. But I do not qualify at all for all the other uh, hypermobility tests with my hands, with my neck, with my, my other parts of my body, or even my shoulders, perfectly fine range of motion. But my lower back, my lumbar spine is quite, quite flexible. So let's clear out a couple of words. What is hypermobility? What is instability? What is subluxation? What is joint sprain or ligamentous sprain? So as we just talked about, a hypermobility is when the joints have an unusually large range of motion. There is always a little bit of like, it's okay if it goes a little bit further, but this would be quite excessively going further. So for example, the elbow joint is supposed to have about zero degrees of extension. And with hypermobility, it goes quite nicely below 10, 15 degrees. Joint instability is when the surrounding tissue structures of the joint fail to stabilize 
and it's quite a high risk for dislocation. So joint instability alone is not necessarily going to cause you dislocation. It's more like put you at high risk. And some, but not all, hypermobility, hypermobile joints have instability. And some, but not all, joint, joints with instability have hypermobility of normal ranges of motion for that joint. So I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but <laughs> it means that just because you have a joint instability, it still could be neurologically driven. It doesn't have to be EDS driven. And just because you have hypermobility, it doesn't mean that it's going to have inst it's going to be unstable and it's going to dislocate. Okay. And this is something that we do all the time with our active passive special tests in a physiotherapy practice. Whenever somebody has an ankle sprain, we right away check the passive uh, structure, the, the passive control of the joint, our ligamentous stress test. Uh, to make sure, and then during that assessment, we further evaluate if there's more screening needed. A joint subluxation and dislocation topic is another commonly were used commonly used uh, um, umbrella term, but let's clear them a little bit out. So dislocation means when a displacement of a bone, its natural position has happened in the joint, so it's not in the right spot. When this is where the two bones that form the joint fully separate from each other and they need to be placed back together. There's very few joints in the body that could be conservatively put back together or under sedation. Most of them require surgical intervention. Although subluxation is just a partial dislocation. So it can be, it can be no less painful than a full dislocation, but the two bones that form the joint are still partially in contact with each other. Okay. And then sometimes what happens is that like a, a kneecap dislocates, and relocates on their own. Same with um, common uh, elbow dislocation happens with uh, little kids that picked up by their parents and the radial bone in your elbow dislocates and then with a specific movement, we can quickly relocate it. Now, a sprain is an injury to the ligaments around the joint. So the ligaments are strong, flexible fibers. They also contain collagen and they hold the joints, the bones together and this is really in more like functional anatomy. It's not just like they always do their job. There are certain points where they have a loose position and certain position where they really have to work harder than the muscles. And when a ligament is too far stretched and develops tears, they can also develop painful swelling and, you know, just unstable joints. So I hope this makes sense. Um, so why do symptoms change? as we age related to hypermobility. So the juvenile and the adolescent body is still growing and they have different cellular structures. I call them, we call them the bendy bodies or I like to call my, my little patients uh, gummy bears because they always laugh at that. I think it's a sweet way of saying like that. Ah, we can mold you in any direction we want to, but there are certain movements that we did not want to mold you towards. Uh, and as skeletal maturation happens, which can be tracked um, through uh, multiple ways on the iliac crest on an x-ray and the pelvic bone, the hand x-ray. It's really a huge uh, variation uh, through uh, gender and um, I'm sure through, through race. I see sometimes kids having their um, skeletal maturity reached by age 14 and other times not until 20. So by tracking uh, skeletal maturation and soft tissue maturation, which usually finishes around age 24, a normal stiffening starts to occur. And this is a time when people start to recognize, wow, now it's difficult to compensate. I need more muscle mass. I need more support. I need aids. I need a, a support belt because I'm just not as flexible anymore. And so I definitely noticed that around age 25, 24, um, when the body dis decides to get a little bit more stiffer um, and finishes maturation when when painful conditions arise. And as we age, we develop, we develop, develop normal wear and tear-like changes. And this is when early onset of osteoarthritis can happen. And just from, again, from my perspective, um, I had some nasty lower back pain when I was very, very young physio. And so the doctors recommended to have some x-rays done. And even age 21, I already had moderate level of osteoarthritis in my sacral joint and my lumbar spine. Um, I haven't checked it since because 
I don't have pain anymore, but um, I just know that even at that time, because of my hypermobility, I already had to deal with some early onset osteoarthritis. And obviously this is a big topic. We're not gonna talk about osteoarthritis today, but I just wanted to make sure that you understand how, as you go through life, and I'm not sure how many uh, teenagers are here uh, listening to this webinar and how many of you are middle age, how many of you are older adults, um, it can it can be a very different um, perspective. Uh, so I absolutely love this uh, scientific research. I hope you see it at the bottom of the page because I I wanted to make sure that anytime I use a picture, you can have uh, where or you can have um, a link to um, where the information is coming from. And there's a lot of research into adult postural spinal pathologies and changes. And the uh, the the um, World Health Organization is now recognizing postural changes and degenerative changes um, related to like scoliosis, kyphosis. We don't like let's just call them spinal asymmetries. Um, they recognize them as a global burden of disease. And believe it or not, 68% of the Old, not, I wouldn't call older adult, like 60 and above uh, population has a form of scoliosis and kyphosis. Again, let's call them just spinal changes, spinal asymmetries. And it really starts with this vicious cycle of postural changes and then degenerative processes. And again, postural changes and degenerative processes. So um, I assess for these during my clinical practice. Uh, spinal condition is absolutely my favorite topic. So you have to stop making me talk too much about this but basically when i look at a patient i look at a client and i find that there's significant imbalance in the frontal plane on the side view or bending forward in the transverse plane um i can identify what are the consequences like compensatory mechanisms maybe a tight muscle here maybe more rotation in the vertebra and basically what happens is that our body is trying its best to compensate for that, but when these building blocks of our vertebrae cannot handle at one segment, which is typically the most load-bearing segments, our L4-5, the lumbar, lower back, 4, 5, 3, 4 area, they develop further, further um, misalignments. And we can see this in uh, x-rays, and we can see, we can measure them. These are these words here referring to uh, thoracic kyphosis, the roundness of the back is changing, the lower back alignment changes. Oftentimes our pelvis is more tilted under. And as the body is trying to make sure that it's keeping you as much as center as possible, we are gonna have a very unique, very individual change regarding our soft tissues, our muscles, our ligaments. And if you already have more flexibility in the joint, you can see um, it's gonna impact the, the intervertebral disc and the facet joint. So it's gonna put more pressure, more work on the load bearing structures, which in HEDS, H HSD, it's already under tremendous amount of loading. And then this position can also create, um, if let's say it's more imbalanced, more one to one side, put more pressure on your knee, which already more sensitive to osteoarthritis. And then develop you develop bunion on one side only. So it's very interesting for me to see all these various age groups and just detect, wow, if I can help that teenager get into a better alignment because they also have a hypermobility, I might be able to prevent their middle age um, painful status and maybe even reduce or halt the progression of an early onset osteoarthritis. So then what causes pain with hypermobility? I collected, this is completely my thoughts. So, um, uh, based on obviously some research, but obviously there's much more to the story, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a scientific evaluation. I'm going to use the foot for this. So there are pain receptors uh, in the joint capsule and these nociceptors signal and code the impact of any mechanical stimuli. And we call them noxious stimuli because it creates an, 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 a negative impact. And so those painful receptors can definitely notice like, oh, I don't like to be in this shearing position, pain, pain, pain. It can also be to, due to imbalance or insufficiency of the local or the global muscles. So let's say in the foot, there are muscles that are more locally, like let's say the tiny little ones in this picture over here, another little one over here, but there are ones that are more global and coming from the knee all the way down to the foot. It puts different 
tension, spasm, overactivation, Charlie horse sensation, and myalgia means muscle pain in those structures. We can also develop pain due to a repetitive overuse of the soft tissues. For example, bursitis. I'm sure many of you have heard how the bursa is like a little cushion, a little pillow separating certain tissues in our body. And it just rubs so much because of the optimal alignment that it develops pain, inflammation. And we can also have tendinopathy. It's an umbrella term for tendinosis and tendinitis. Anything that is itis is usually inflammation, and tendinosis, it means that there's pathology, there's changes to the structure of the tendon. Inflammation can also hurt, for example, in the hip, if it's a, if it's a very severe osteoarthritis, there's protein in the joint, and it's really, really creating this kind of nasty sensation, um, but it could also be from venous congestion, such as varicose veins, those can hurt as well. Lymphatic pooling, it's not a traditional lymphedema that develops due to lymphatic disease. It's much more like if there's not, uh, our body has 15 liters of lymph and three liters of them changes every day. And if our body can't get rid of um, that, the waste, that three liters of waste, all those proteins and all those uh, extra fluids that is not belonging there, just our sewage system is not working well. So your your cells, your tissues are bathing in this um, non-optimal fluid. So that can also create more pooling and more uh, painful tissues. And finally, I place here neuropathy. Uh, the small fiber neuropathy is really common with uh, EBS, and um, it's basically a nerve-related tissue damage, and it can create burning sensation, paresthesia. It's kind of like um, similar to sciatica. It can also be allodynia, which is pain due to stimulus that does not normally provoke pain, just as a feather touching you. And you should only, it should only produce sensation yet you feel pain. Okay. So, and I'm sure we could talk about even in the, in the foot, like bone spurs developing against tendons. So there's many more things that um, can cause pain. So what is our rehabilitation pathway then? So first of all, um, we have pain and inhibition of the optimal muscle function. So this is, this is the number one thing. But we're also dealing with inflammation, we're dealing with functional changes, and in the long run, we're dealing with structural changes. So in a treatment, first our goal is to reduce pain, pain inflammation, and promote optimal tissue healing. After that, our goal is with physical activation, physical rehabilitation, is to improve motor control training, meaning that we have to have an optimal muscle balance in the global and the local muscles as well, so they can control the joint. Because if we have great um, global muscles, but the local muscles are not supporting you well, you're gonna have you can they have to work too hard for for a task that they're not even signed up for. And for example, I see oftentimes after subluxated shoulders that people have some tendinosis, tendinopathy in their, in their um, sup supraspinatus muscle. So they have a hard time lifting the shoulder. So what they do is they use um, um, auxiliary muscles and other muscles that are helping that movement to lift the arm up. And the consequence will be pain somewhere else, not necessarily in the shoulder. It could be in the rib cage, it could be in the neck because of the compensatory mechanism. So once the motor control training is going well, then comes uh, the topic of strength training and cardio in order to uh, enhance structural changes. And yes, we can create structural changes. Um, so what the root cause of EDS is not a structural change, but the byproduct of EDS is the structural change. Um, so there was a very great recent study on the benefits of strength training on musculoskeletal system health by Maestroni and um, their scientific um, peers in 2020. And they concluded that uh, strength training provided the most thorough, uh, unique benefits to the musculoskeletal system in common disorders and in healthy people. And it has multi-system benefits, so it can impact your cardiovascular health, metabolic health, cancer-related problems, depression, tendon, cartilage, muscle, bone, sleep, dementia. So it's kind of a powerhouse, not a powerhouse tool in our hands to do strength training. So this is something that we're going to talk about more today. 
uh, but because it's important that the application of the mechanical loading must be specific to obtain a desired positive adaptation. So it's so healthcare professionals should recognize that health strengthening among the general population and among the um, unhealthy population also very important because it has multi systemic and specific musculoskeletal benefits. But it's also important that the practical applications and the training programs has to be clearly outlined for the specific disorder and has to have prevention strategies and it is also superior, oops, sorry, um, uh, to stretching and balance training. Okay, so don't worry, we're not gonna read this whole big slide, but this is from the research. Um, you can see in the first row, so they picked what are the tissues that are benefiting from strength training. So here's the one that are most important for us, the joint cartilage, the joint cap, the, the surface of the joint, the bone, the tendons, and the muscles. And they write down what is the function. And then you can read them later. We're going to move to the next row. So, um, so what is it creating is that it can increase, for example, the volume of the cartilage, which is in hypermobility, is quite, quite important. Uh, it can improve the mineral density of the bone. It can increase tendon stiffness, which is again, very, very helpful with EDS, HSD, HD, HSD. And for the muscles, it can increase the muscle cells and can create more healthy muscle cells. Um, so in each category, they try to create some specific targeted recommendations. This is not part uh, of our lecture today to learn what is exactly um, muscle uh, contraction adaptation and what are these uh, big words. But at the very end row, you can see examples of application for common related conditions. So they were able to um, rule in knee osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, tendon stiffness, and um, muscle, um, lack of muscle production, sarcopenia, which means that you're not having enough muscle cells. Um, so basically, we have strengthening in our pocket, and we're not recommending as therapists enough, and we're not using, utilizing enough. So I think this is going to be a great starting point for future researches on um, EDS, how to track um, what else we can what else we can see as beneficial for EDS population in strength training. So even though it's clear that, oh, yay, well, let's start strengthening, the decision making is not as easy. So this is again from the same scientific research, how many um, subjective and objective variables can contribute into developing program, an exercise program, and then how to progress. So this whole decision making or strength training is is not an easy topic, and uh, th this is where like where physio ends and when strength training starts. So it's kind of like my table, but also I work with an athletic performance uh, physio who's who does this to um, high level athletes. So it's always a little bit of an in between to find when are you ready for it and when you're still sticking with your motor control strategies for physiotherapy. Um, that I just wanted to show you that it's not, it's not, um, let's do 10 sets or three sets of 10 repetitions. There's a lot of other psychological, musculoskeletal system, social factors, general health factors, training related variables, and exercise progression variables that we have to consider. And so just for, I just wanted to show you another interesting thing. It's like, this is an example of a potential strengthening session session and progression for a postmenopausal woman with low bone mass, meaning osteopenia. And you can see how the first it recommends a familiarization phase, like, uh, and then phase two, strength and endurance emphasis, and then phase three, strength emphasis. So by the time they really get to the actual real deal, the bottom row, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, progression that was already considered in, and I found this is a, such an interesting uh, chart note to go through um, with exercises and how, how, what sets they start with and um, what are the intensity that they go through. So I just wanted to show you that when we are preparing a workout routine, there's a lot of things that comes into that. So 
um, let's say you would like to exercise and <clears throat> you have no idea where to go. You have no idea what to choose. You're a little bit lost, a little bit discouraged. There's so much information on the internet. Everybody says, well, exercise is good for you. Just do it. But you might have injured yourself. You have, might have some uh, bad experiences. Um, you want to do it alone. You not necessarily want to join a club. So how can we do some risk analysis prior to any exercise to decide, is it a good day or is it a good season of life to do any exercises? So I like to call this the red light, green light. Um, do you have the green light exor to exercise? So before you do anything, whether if it's just an organized sport or a class or jogging or at-home yoga or any workout, check in with your body and follow the next steps to determine, determine if it's the right time or day to exercise. And we're going to go through what to do when you get a green light and what to do when you get an orange or red light. So um, this is a little bit longer slide uh, and feel free to stand up. If you have a mirror next to you, go through this self check-in because I'm going to talk a little bit more than what just written over here. So the first step is in standing or maybe you're exercising and actually sitting, take a look at your posture in the mirror. Try to check it from front, from side. If you have people around you, they can also help you with identifying things. Do you see anything obvious that is unusual? That is asymmetrical, something that is like, oh, why is my shoulder much higher? Why is my pelvis twisted to the left? That is not usual for me. Why am I leaning over to one side? Are my knees a little bit more twisted today? Am I standing with my leg a little bit rotated out? Is my right foot more tilted in? Are you just leaning only to one side than the other? And is your head, for example, centered? Or do you have your head a little bit forwarded? Check in your posture and get familiar with how you look like on a daily basis and befriend your body type, befriend the way you stand. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It doesn't mean that there's something uh, you have to be aware of, but uh, sorry, we have to be concerned of, but awareness really helps you to recognize, oh, that, that was not there yesterday. Why is my right shoulder just more hanging out in the front? Why is my right collarbone just a little bit more protruding or sticking out. Next step is to check your range of movement. Some of you might be very familiar with your range of motion. Some of you might hear it for the first time. It's not about to learn all the joint range of motion in the body. It's more about if you have a problematic joint, learn how to, what are the available range of motion. Let's say it's your shoulder and you know that your shoulder joint can hyperextend, meaning you can go much, much further than is the optimal range of motion. Again, we're not gonna go through these today, but, but be aware, and most of this information quite easy to even watch on a YouTube video when you type in range of motion measurement, shoulder joint or ankle joint, and, and just make sure that you gather some information. But you can also focus on um, um, what is painful that day, so not just the quality of the motion, so the quantity of the motion, but the quality of the motion. And if you notice some stiffening, some compensation, some fear maybe, like, ooh, I always able to lift up my right arm, but you know what? Today I have to stop halfway. This is not feeling good. Be suspicious and, and just shake it off and check it again. Is it just a, a one-time one, one thing or is it actually every single time you lift up, something is not okay there? Is there some unusual clicking or popping or locking in that joint today? Uh, next, check for muscle activation. So um, is there a particular region in the body, let's say your lower back, where you can identify some compensatory mo movement or compensatory muscle activation? Maybe one side of your lower back is overactive and always spasmy and tight, maybe even have some Charlie horse uh, sensation. And the other side is quite underactive and it creates a little bit of off tilted uh, ness in your body. Can you correct that by lengthening? Can you, can you feel that, okay, today is not too bad. I think I'm ready to exercise. Or you know what? I think today is really particularly bad. I have to seek out medical help for it. And then finally, check in with your balance do you feel under control? Can you sense your joints? Do you feel like you have a good balance? Do you feel like your feet are rooted into the ground and you can really feel that where your body is in space? And for some of you, it might be a little bit harder and some of you will be easily feeling like, yeah, I can feel my hand, I can feel my legs, I can feel my feet, I can feel where my head is in space. So 
this is a very common slide summarizing joint mobility assessment using the Bison scoring system. And we typically do this, obviously, with goniometer, but you can always check. Again, sometimes I see patients coming to the clinic with their spine being extremely hypermobile one day, and then the next day or the next week, they actually bend much less forward. So, it, and, and then I get suspicious because it could be good, it could be bad, right? It's sometimes if a joint just stiffens up, I'm suspicious, oh, maybe it's trying to protect the nerve and that's why the lower back muscles are spasming. And I will get, I, I, I do this basically regularly with my hypermobile patients to make sure that I, ha I have the, their average and not just like that one time assessment, okay? Um, so we also have to check the cardiovascular system and I collected a couple um, information here. Uh, I think I have, um, one sec, I, do, I don't have it on this side, but I think another slide we're going to talk more about the, the performance zones um, and the heart rate target zone uh, later. And I think I'm going to have the link where I have this picture from. I had a very hard time finding a scientific research link for this. So I used the website and I think I have the link a little bit later. So basically, uh, some of you might have um, heart rate issues, autonomic dysfunction, and and symptoms of autonomic dysfunction, and that's what's limiting your exercise. So it's important to check the cardiovascular, cardiopulmonary system. And some of the basic thing is that, do you know what is your maximum heart rate? So for example, it, there's more research on this, so this is just a, a debrief. If you calculate 20, 220 minus your age, you get a number. And that's your 100% that you don't want to reach unless you are doing less than five minutes of training and it's really just increasing your spin race, sprint race speed. I'm not sure how many of you are right now in the position of like, yeah, let's increase my sprint race speed. Most of you will be probably in the uh, number two target zone or number three target zone light or moderate training. So here you can see um, if you're tracking it through a smartwatch and you calculate, okay, my moderate is between 133 to 152. How do we get that number? You calculate your uh, 220 minus your age, that's your 100, and then you calculate what is the 80% of that 100%. And let's say this person who they're using as an example, with moderate level of activity, they want to exercise for about 10 to 40 minutes and they don't want to, they want to stay within this target zone. And it's just to improve aerobic fitness, create some light muscular fatigue, but you can still breathe through easily and you can do, you can have some moderate sweating, but it's basically for longer exercises. And then maybe your uh, trail walk, you want to do just light target zone. So this is a great uh, slide to come back to, to track your, um, your heart, heart rate target zone and not to go too crazy. I remember when um, I, I started a bar fitness classes and um, I, was, I was in the middle of a class, I was having a lot of fun and I started having some palpitations. And I'm like, well, that's weird, but I completely ignored it. Like, I'm fine, I, I'm not feeling tired, I'm not out of breath. And then I'm like, it's not going away. And I was wearing my sport watch, I looked at my heart rate and it was like 182. Well, that's way at the max top of my uh, target zone. So I had to stop, even though I was not tired, I was not winded, all, all I had was an elevated heart rate. Who knows why? My, my body just decided, hmm, that's, that's not fun, let's do something else. Maybe it was positional changes, like some of you have my head pop, right? Uh, so you can also measure your blood pressure if that's something that is meaningful for you. And you can also measure with a pulse oximeter your oxygen saturation. So try to mold this green light, lead, right system uh, for your own health. You could also check with your checking with your nervous system, such as dizziness, vertigo that day. Are you going through an episode of migraine? That's not a great idea to give yourself a red light if you have um, ocular migraine, for example. Um, don't go to the running club if you have a tension or headache and you feel like um, you would need more rest and hydration. Are you experiencing brain fog? Are you, do you have increased fatigue? Maybe you're playing strategic sport and it's not good to have some brain fog or, or sudden fatigue when you have to concentrate because you're rock climbing, for example. 
Um, check in also, are you just in a great mood today for exercise? Remember, exercise is not a punishment. You're doing it because you want it. You, you also, it's also considered it's good for you and it's needed, but at the same time, you want to enjoy your workouts. And also consider, are you trying something new today? Do you feel anxious about it or do you feel confident? Do you know what's worked well before, what hasn't? So um, this uh, presentation and webinar, I don't want you to feel like it's an invitation to try something brand new and freak your nervous system out. Make sure that you check in with your body. And then some multi-system um, check-ins. Uh, do you have any weird digestive symptoms? Maybe you're bloating or you're constipated that day and it just does not feel right to put some more burden on your body. Uh, do you have your period? Maybe you're ovulating. Maybe you are going through menopause and that day is just not fun for you. Did you have a good sleep? I, I For me, that's the number one thing. If I don't sleep well, I, I it's a guarantee I cannot exercise that day. So sleep is my number one, number one, basically tool to feel healthy and happy. Is there a sudden change in the barometric pressure? Um, have you taken your medication your, or your, your supplements or are you hydrating well that day? Um, also, make sure that uh, if you're working out, let's say from home, do you have a good home setup? Um, did you have extra work that day that you already tired of? Did you socialize that day and you don't really want to go out again to work out because that's with your friends again? Or do you have friends and family around to help you to check in? So consider your social uh, history, consider your lifestyle changes as well. And then finally, have you planned your day? And remember, uh, you can have some uh, difficulties arising, but at the same time, it takes cognitive effort to work, to have screen time, to have planning, attending appointments, driving to work, driving the kids to school. It takes physical effort to do some walking, grocery shopping, self-care, and it's an emotional effort, uh, effort as well. So if exercise would put another layer of this on you, maybe, maybe it's not the best day to give yourself a green light. So let's say, some of you said, yeah, today is a red, maybe orange light day. So track these days. Share with your healthcare provider. See if you can identify a pattern to find a better day. And maybe you will figure out, wow, on the weekends, on Saturday mornings, that's my best time to exercise. Every Monday, I'm brain dead. <laughs> Every Wednesday, I need to just relax and have a, um, a bath. <laughs> and so... Just because you can, it doesn't mean you should. Don't push yourself. And just because you can't at the moment doesn't mean you won't later. So choosing some restorative, somatic exercises, cognitive exercises, even a crossword or some puzzle. Uh, but you can also do actual uh, body movements such as breath work or meditation, vagal nerve exercise or lymphatic mobilization. Try to find other ways, be creative, um, to move your body or move your brain or move your cells or the fluid inside your body. Let's say you have given yourself a green light. So where should we go from here? So there's no HEDS, HSD specific evidence-based research on these are the best exercises. do this. So it's not a magic bullet. It's not, again, we're, everybody has different symptoms. So you have to take ownership of your health by reaching out to healthcare providers, to trainers, to physios, to OTs, to your specialists. This is my plan. These are my symptoms. I think I have the green light to exercise. Rely on the clinical expertise when the research evidence is not giving you the tool, the green light, what to do. So we're gonna talk about physical exercises with hypermobility and how to choose exercises. So, this is from the World Health Organization from 2010. They did a big, big kind of systematic, systematic review on physical activity for health. And the World Health Organization has provided this global recommendation for the general population um, uh, relevant to the prevention of non-communicable diseases. So NDS is not a non-communicable disease. Non-communicable disease is more like heart attack, cancer, um, I'm not sure, heart, heart, or, um, what else is there? So pulmonary disorder. So something like, uh, there's not very specific. And they recommended 
that in order to prevent these non-communicable diseases, uh, at least 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic physical activity with muscle strengthening activities involving major muscle groups on two or more days a week is recommended. And they also look at um, all kinds of like types of activities, duration, frequency, intensity, volume. Um, but I think this is the most important takeaway. We're going to go in more details with the actual research uh, after 2010. So basically, you want to look at your week and check in. Can I do 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise? I, I'm not always having 150 minutes per week. Do I feel bad about it? Not at all. But I try to achieve even just like m once a day, a 30 minute walk or um, as a physio, I thankfully work out with my patients as well. But I, I try to track through my smartwatch, how much I uh, move my body. And this is the this is kind of the bare minimum. But this is for prevention. Remember, it's not for treatment or not for um, helping specific disorders. I collected this. Um, a slide and I was thinking of putting all kinds of funny pictures around it so I it looks like I forgot it <laughs> but I always want to have a personal goal to exercise even when you have EDS so what is your goal maybe some of you want to do the sun run some of you want to do triathlon multi-day hike I had many patients who surprised me with these requests maybe some of you just want to get back to the gym and start weightlifting some of you want to join a soccer or a volleyball club and just do once a week with your best friends. Maybe some of you want to play pickleball or play badminton. Um, some of you want to just be able to walk the dog once a day for one hour. Some of you are desired to do some at-home yoga, fitness, Pilates online. Uh, some of you want to do occasional just walks on the beach, some trail walk, just when you feel the need to get outside. Um, maybe some of you want to improve the posture, prevent flares or track, uh, prevent uh, crashes or just feel better from moving your body. And some of you just want to start again after an injury and manage the symptoms. So try to have a personal goal when you start to exercise and look at all. The, and I probably could have filled this whole page with other options and other personal goals. It's much easier to, to look at a goal versus like, I have to exercise because the, the World Health Organization told me I have to do 150 minutes per week. So when I uh, reach this phase with my patients, with my clients in the physiotherapy setting, I'm very lucky that we have Pilates reformers, stability chair, the balanced body springboard, um, resistance band, power band training, and we also have weightlifting, dumbbells, and also heavy weightlifting. I have three colleagues uh, who are doing power lifting and heavy weight lifting. So I always have a lot of tools around me. But just to let you know, most of my patients have chronic pain. So I barely ever get to weight lifting with my, my patients. Um, and if they're really, really well ahead in their game, I just refer them to my colleagues because that's their favorite topic to do, <clears throat> even though they're not uh trained or not interested in, in managing joint hypermobility i can give them a, a report and and help them guide their uh, physical rehabilitation but it's really important that i try to uh integrate into my practice strength training and general exercise training just to help my clients understand that it's not about that external rotation with the resistance band it's more about okay you want to be able to run we have to focus on your hip strength. We have to be able to jump. You have to be able to squat. You have to be able to do this and that. And that's how we guide our programs towards um, success. But let's say you would like to start something new or you just like to restart. There are plenty of exercise in the community. And this is, ex this is really what I encourage all of you re restarting or starting all over because um, and we're going to go through the benefits. So basically, let's go through the benefits first. So clubs, groups, and classes are guided by trained professionals. They're, these classes are more predictable, keeps you accountable, and you can ask for help. That's a great way to socialize, maybe discuss your concerns with your friends or your uh, club members. And you yeah, my shoulder really hurts. And if other people say, like, yeah, my shoulder hurts too, and they don't have EDS, you can realize, wow, other people have pain as well. You can plan your sessions ahead. Let's say you can book 
a season, you can book a month ahead and you can evaluate how well you did. Do you need longer rest breaks? Can you increase the intensity to go to a level two class? If possible, try to follow a plan or track the variables such as time, distance, session per week, and do not increase more than 10% per week, even if you feel great. And try to just pick one variable. Let's say you're gonna do 30 minutes of yoga class three times a week. You don't wanna go to 60 minutes five times a week, okay? Do not expect the trainer to be familiar with your condition. Do your own red light, green light self-check-in and ev before every single session. And if something hurts, like a specific stretch or pose, ask the trainer if they can provide with some feedback. And maybe they say, oh yeah, your shoulder is not supposed to be uh, shifted forward. Let's bring it back. Does that help you? And so it's great when you have constant feedback in a class. But then you can also bring this topic, this meaningful task, to your physiotherapy, occupational therapy session, and they can because it might be outside of the scope of the practice of the trainer or, or teacher. And at times of pain, think about it. Is it really EDS or is it just a meaningful task because you have an overactive muscle? So for example, you can join walking groups like long distance. I know there's plenty um, in South Vancouver. I'm a, obviously, I'm, I don't know where you're tuning in from, but I had so many patients who joined a lovely club. Um, say Sun, something Sun. I, I forgot the name, but it's in South Vancouver and it was a lovely group of uh, older adults and they were meeting for pole walk every Sunday, maybe even Wednesday, and they walked like crazy amounts around the neighborhood. Um, there are restorative nature walk clubs as well. You can join hiking club, running club if you're you are able to do that. But there are swimming, cross country clubs, skiing clubs. Um, and then here are the group classes. So there are obviously more trusted uh, places where you can do uh, clinical Pilates, Pilates, yoga, bar fitness, um, Eldoa exercises, strength training. So when you go into the community and some ha some place has a good reputation, you can still communicate, look, I'm going to always do it a little bit differently and let the teacher know just to monitor you a little bit more closely. But don't take ownership of your own health and know your own body and don't expect that people will recognize like, ooh, that joint is about to subluxate or that joint is not stabilized well uh, because exercise is not physiotherapy, <laughs> not always physiotherapy, and the physiotherapy is not always exercise either. So when you're exercising, you just enjoy and do it for helping your body. When you go to a physiotherapy session, we're focusing on the meaningful task and the meaningful pain, meaningful complaint. So here's another exercise option for you, cardio. So this here's the link, bodycomplete.co.uk, heart rate training zones and monitors. Is that the link? Yeah. And um, is another one that I really like, just a little summary of um, if you're working out, remember we were at the target zone, moderate and light, maybe even some of you easier recovery. So if you go to tar target your target heart rate zone three, the benefits are improving aerobic um, strength. So your heart, your heart strength, and it creates some light muscular fatigue, but you can still breathe through it and you have some moderate levels of sweating. And um, it's recommended for uh, everybody for typical moderately long exercises. So you can t go to 10 to 40 minutes. Light activities, you can do 40 to 80 minutes. So your trail walk, if it's really flat, just along the side of the beach, maybe you can walk for 60 minutes a day. But if your heart rate zone is heart rate max is more around 133 155 you might not want to walk for 60 minutes okay um and i'm not sure i i could talk about it for a really long time i just really wanted to show you that this is a way that you can track your cardio and you can calculate how much running is appropriate and um are you doing too much are you doing too little and you can have some all kinds of cool stats on your phone from your uh, watch, your smartwatch, to see how your heart rate was going throughout the day. I always do that every single walk I do, every single running, every Pilates workout. I constantly check my my heart rate, and if if I see that that day is not a good day for my heart, I I don't feel discouraged. I'm not feeling sad. I always say, okay, today I cannot do it, and that's okay. There will be a next day where I feel more energetic and more um, on track. 
this is another great way of tracking your exertion and it can be used for strengthening as well. The Borg rating of perceived exertion, we just refer to it as RPE charts. And it looks like I forgot to include the website for this. So for the handouts, I will make sure that um, I have it, the website where, but it's something that basically lots of research around it. It's not um, an idea of one person. This has been used for decades in physical therapy. And you to, this is basically to measure the intensity of your exercise based on how far you feel you are working. So zero being your complete rest, you're just watching the TV, and 10 being the hardest effort you could ever possibly do, and you're completely out of breath, you're unable to talk. That's not something that you want to. You wanna put yourself, again, this four to six, two to three range. So you feel like you can exercise for hours, breathing heavily, but you can hold still a short conversation in moderate or in light activity, feels like you can maintain it for hours, easy to breathe and carry a conversation. So let's say you have a um, garden party on the beach, it involves you to stand for a long time and then it involves you to walk to the beach and have a little bit of swimming and then you walk out and it's a continuous light activity, but you can easily maintain, com carry a conversation and easy to breathe through it. Um, so this is usable again for both cardio and strengthening. And here's an example. So if you give yourself a seven out of 10 RP, it means that you should be you should be at about seven out of 10 in terms of perceived exertion or about 70% of your effort. So for strength uh, set, you should have three more repetitions left in the tank because you're already at seven out of 10. Uh, so you can use it very broken down, but it can also be used as, um, as a daily how you feel checking in so it can change on a day-to-day -day basis which exactly what i was talking about based on how you are feeling the same workout could feel different on another day depending on number of factors such as your stress levels your nutrition how you slept how well your hydration is so it's another great way of checking in and I would like to talk about, and we're really close to the end, so we're gonna have lots of time for q and I would like to talk about some yoga and stretching. So it's a, it's a common uh, theme I notice that people who are more flexible, they either praise yoga or they say yoga is the enemy, same as with stretching. So when somebody wants to do yoga, there are yoga styles like Hatha yoga that does not do the picture, that the, 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 the person that people are doing on these pictures, it's not gonna be, uh, crazy contortions. So is it bad for you that you in a position you put your arms over your head and maybe reach with your uh, uh, do a side plank and you step one side the warrior pose? You're not going into prolonged positions. You're not doing end range joint movement. You're not doing loaded movement, repetitive. So if you can avoid or limit the combination of prolonged end range loaded or repetitive movement during the yoga class and there's also no risks associated with subluxation movement associated with risk of subluxation this dislocation that's a great yoga class and again you might have to uh cherry pick which one you can do out of an online yoga group or an in-person yoga group but you can modify it to your own needs but for example look at that photo on the bottom right if you have neck instability, that's not something that's gonna help <laughs> help you because there's a lot of risk of uh, subluxation of your neck joint. So do a risk analysis. And then about stretching. So stretching exercises are designed to improve mobility. Do you need more mobility with uh, EDS? Well, the answer could be yes. I prescribe it all the time. If you develop compensatory mechanisms around your shoulder joints, I might have to release a certain muscle or I might have to give you a stretching exercise. It's not gonna be a complex stretching workout though. It's going to be one specific release. So don't be afraid of stretching. But if you, if you sign up for a stretching workout, 60 minute workout session, that might not be the most beneficial for you um, because stretching exercise will not enhance your performance. It's not gonna necessarily improve your health, which is, a bit vague sentence, but again, it's from a scientific research, prevent injuries or reduce muscle soreness. It has a very, very important uh, uh, 
it's a very important tool in our toolkit for physios, but you have to use them wisely and you have to know, okay, I always have the sternocleidal muscle in my neck overactive and I regularly stretch it and release it and it feels better because it was told by someone, my healthcare providers, that it's good for me versus I'm going to do all the neck stretches available on the internet. Okay, and finally, exercise options such as gym. So I don't know why people absolutely love the gym topic the most. <laughs> I love gym workouts, but again, check in with your body Are, or check in with your situation. Are you brand new to the gym? Do you know what exercises are available in your local gym? Do you discuss this, the, the type of exercises, the machines with your physio or work with a trainer who can introduce you to all your options and you can create communication around, I have hypermobility, I'm not supposed to do this, this, this. What are the things we can do together safely? Do you know how to properly warm up and cool down? If you don't, then maybe we can do a webinar about it, <laughs> but also you can talk, discuss this with, with a trainer versus you know, lone wolfing and just trying to figure out everything on your own. Do you know how many sets and repetition is recommended? Well, maybe if you go back into the slides, you can check it out what is recommended. But again, it's really unique and there's a big decision-making toolkit for us to know what is the best for you. And do you have good techniques for your exercise that you do? So let's say you love doing squats and you have done it for a long time and you would like to add some weights to it. Checking in with your, your technique would be very, very important. So on our closing thoughts, um, my closing thoughts. <laughs> so this, um, this um, quote is from Dr. Perry Nicholson. Uh, he is an absolute gem in the medical field. His Instagram called Stop Chasing Pain. He's a chiropractor from New Jersey, and he does a lot of cellular work through lymphatic mobilization and a lot of osteopathic medicine. So he's a very great thinker. And this might be a little bit of a bitter sentence, but I still believe that it's, it's true um, for a lot of uh, people living with chronic illnesses that it's usually not the exercise and not the last exercise that you've done is the issue. It's the rest of your life built around the exercise program that needs changing or needs modification. So don't be hard on yourself if it's not one thing, not one magic bullet. I always say that the best exercises are the ones that are done and are meaningful to you. So there's no perfect exercise. There's no uh, evidence-based exercise for Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, but uh, strength training has the most benefit, the multisystemic benefits to it. And effect, this is also from Dr. Nicholson. Effective things don't have to be complicated. On the basics and fundamentals before you look for the shiny new object to make the difference. So think about it. Can you do 150 minutes per week, including moderate intensity workouts, including aerobic, maybe strength training? And can you do multiple uh, major muscle groups two or more days a week? And thank you very much for your attention. We have 20 more minutes left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the Q&A box and I'm going to start going linear and feel free to add more questions. And if there's not too many questions, I'm going to just indulge on them. If there's 100 questions, I'm going to try to be very prompt. So the next 20 minutes, I can answer as many as possible. Okay. So um, I think the first one was just a comment. Um, so how does having EDS put you at greater risk of getting long COVID? So this would be a multi-systemic question that would be better answered by um, a medical doctor because um, it is not the scope of my practice. I could Google the answer, but I don't know the answer. So I would like to let you know that just please work with your primary care providers or a specialist. Where can I get EDS and connective tissue issues tested? So um, EDS uh, genetically can be um, tested, but HEDS, the hypermass uh, type, um, as according to Dr. Lucia Ma, would be the best to have an OT, have a physio or a family doctor confirm that you are going through your clinical reflection sheet of for, for uh, clinical investigation for HEDS. And then if, if you're testing positive for that, I do that with my patients as well. I write a report for the family doctor and the family doctor can refer you to a specialist or you can self-refer yourself, for example, Dr. Lucia Ma, um, to get it further investigated. But there are 
family doctors, there are physiotherapists who are capable of testing your hypermobility, checking the clinical uh, form, and then if you qualify, they can recommend you further testing. Um, yes, Patricia, they, there's no option to mute yourself. We are all automatically muted and or uh, unmuted sorry. <laughs> and yeah so uh, you can type your answers uh, I hope I answered your question Betty what is Schrott therapy so Schrott therapy is a conservative management for scoliosis meaning it's a non-surgical management of scoliosis and kyphosis believe it or not it's over 100 years old 1921 and in Central Europe in Germany it has been widely used as an approach for the management of spinal asymmetry. And when I moved to Canada, I was the third therapist in the country in 2014. So very, very um, uh, low research, no research, no guidelines. And so I always um, want to inform every family doctor I get in contact with that there is conservative management for scoliosis and kyphosis. And it's a, an ex a form of exercise, manual therapy, a form of treatment, physiotherapeutic treatment for uh, spinal asymmetries. So Patricia again, I thought Gabor Mari isn't a doctor though. I searched him on the college and he has no results. All I can find about him is on ayahuasca. <laughs> so he's a clinical psychologist here in Vancouver and he does uh, a, a psychedelic um, research at UBC. So he is a, 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 a medical doctor and um, a, he has a website and so and a hundred million videos on YouTube. So Take a good search, and if you cannot find, email me, and I will help you out. Uh, Liz Walker, wonderful information. I love your approach. Do you have any comments on the new genetic discovery published by Tallinn University? Uh, researchers, the hypermarket species may be the result of B9 folate deficiency. So cellular biology is absolutely my favorite topic. I wish I could restart my whole practice as a functional medicine doctor or, or medical doctor because I love anything that goes into cellular biology. Do I have time for it? Absolutely no. So um, sometimes when I'm not super tired at the end of the day, I listen to podcasts and there's so much it goes into mineral research these days. And um, it's, it's definitely not my scope of practice, so don't take on any advice. Uh, I think everybody's trying to find a magic girl. Girl, is that how you say? And there's always a balance of things. And when something goes into like deficiency, like they do this with scoliosis all the time, like it's vitamin D. Oh, sorry, it's not vitamin D. Oh, it's going to be this. Oh, sorry, it's not that. So they find something. We never know how big of that uh, group is. Whenever you read the research, check the population that they're assessing check is it a systemic review is it a randomized control trial the higher level of, level of evidence because if you pick 14 girls who are all premenarchal and all um having a certain a very specific condition it's sometimes not going to be as impactful as if you check the whole population and maybe everybody's going to be fully deficient in that region of the country for example or in that age group so um b vitamin b um according to my researches is, is it, there's many many vitamin b's and it's a spectrum and bioavailable forms are the most impactful and um, there's a lot of uh, research on folate as well in the research group that i'm following so it's definitely an interesting topic and i can see that it has impact but we still don't know what triggering the genetic um, change so it may my, maybe it's impacting in a way that it's helping the connective tissue to um to re repair remodelate um on a cellular level but it's not still not the root cause of it i hope i i try to answer your question so surely uh, how common are rip subluxation in heds anything to prevent treat um so rib what I see the most is the so-called, you can Google this term, slipping rib syndrome, is when your rib cage and it attaches in the, in the lower ribs, uh, attaches to the cartilage, and the cartilage connects to the sternal bone. They are a little bit more compressed to muscle tension, so they're not like having a nice space at the bottom. Sorry, you don't see me. I'm just holding my hands. I realize you don't see me. So uh, if you put your fingers open wide with your hands, 
in front of you. Now, move some of your fingers closer to each other, shift some of them a little bit to the left, some of them to the right. There are muscles attaching to those ribs. And if you start developing tension, it can compress them. And that compression, that sheer force can create pinching sensation, can create so-called subluxation uh, around the cartilage where it attaches to the bone. It can create um, minor sprains. But it's oftentimes, unless there's a direct trauma, it's not subluxated. It's just not optimally positioned. And we can figure out what's the primary muscle that or joint restriction or nervous system tension or even organ attachment uh, through passive listening and release that, that primary thing. So the treatment would be creating release in the primary vector that's pulling the rib into that direction. And then the prevention would be a uh, motor control strategy. That's remember that's before training. So it's not strength training, it's motor control training, tre teaching your nervous system how to create space in that particular area and um, how the joint attaches to the vertebra, how the joint attaches to the, the chondr chondr uh, chondral region, and then create some, some space and like, a, like an accordion create space in between them. So Shivani, does taking collagen powder help each ADS? Yeah, this is definitely not my scope of practice. I really, really want you to discuss with nutritionists and uh, your doctors uh, because um, I, can't, I can't comment on this. It's not part of my, my training and my, my scope of practice. Uh, tips for seeking, Lynn Snow, tips for seeking diagnosis for children. I have HEDS, my kids are nine and 12, and the pediatrician noticed some hypermobility, but does not feel confident to diagnose. Could a physio diagnose them? So yes, a physio who is trained and educated and properly assesses the joints, more than capable of diagnosing. You just have to make sure that it's somebody who is um, who's doing the job well. And also my pet peeve is checking the spine. So nine to 12 age is really important to check for scoliosis and kyphosis. I'm so surprised that none of the, the HEDS, HSD researchers mentioning scoliosis and kyphosis. I don't know if that's what I see all the time and that's why I notice hypermobility associated with it, but I see so many people having hyper, joint hypermobility and they don't even know they have scoliosis and kyphosis. So it's when you're when you're an adolescent or juvenile, like for nine year olds, it's important that let's have a quick check, quick posture screen, nothing is wrong, then then just just monitor. But don't just go for the hypermobility at that age, but also go for posture screening. Kim, I am in my 60s. And many mornings, my ankle hurts when I walk and it feels like my kneecaps are moving where they shouldn't. This usually gets better after an hour or so. Is this likely joint instability or subluxation? Is there something I can stop this from getting worse? So when you track your symptoms, it's always impacting you in the morning. It can be due to other systemic problems such as venous congestion, lymphatic uh, issues, because when you're resting, that's when this whole um, lymphatic mobilization happens and your body's getting rid of waste. So I would definitely check in. It's, it's like you're loading it for the first time in the morning. And I get it that maybe your muscles and your joints are not really have woken up. But when we get out of bed, we should be able to uh, walk. And that ankle pain could be related to some early onset arthritis. And then as you load, it creates a non-optimal strategy for the muscles that are supporting your knee. And that can create a chain reaction. So as it could be still a lot of different things. So I would get it evaluated. And um, it's definitely not a subluxation if you don't see your kneecap not in the right spot. So if it's in the, it's in the center, it's just in instability. It's not moving out. Hey, Diane, mostly I injure myself while I sleep. I work with a PT on positioning support pillows and braces for injured joints. My problem is with vac vacations and camping. I can take my whole setup with me. Frequently, I wake up with no feeling in both arms. Sometimes it lasts a few hours, sometimes weeks and months. Any thoughts? Yes, I do. I do really see this often um, when you're more flexible. You can contort yourself while you're sleeping, while the active stabilizers in the joints are resting, your muscles are not keeping you stable. The passive stabilizers uh, are not doing a great job. 
And so um, if you lose your sensation, where do you use that? Just forgot. You're feeling in both arms. So it could be something neck related. It could be something rib cage related. It could be venous system related as well. So it's not just one thing, not just like strengthening this area. It very well could be um, some positioning in the area where the brachial plexus, the big chunk of nerves that are coming out of your neck, uh, going uh, under your collarbone and going into your arms. So um, it, it, it does require a little bit further investigation, Diane, but I get it. If I don't move or I don't sleep well, I wake up as well, same same, same feelings. Um, and so it's really important that I, I, I sleep in my, in my own environment. So my best recommendation for now as, as an advice is to take your stuff with you camping and vacations or have a little further investigation. Maybe there's something else that we're not found yet. Um, living life at fullest with Ehlers Stanford. So someone, Erica is asking, what do you, I think of a book called Living Life to the Fullest with Ehlers Danlos Syndrome, a guide to living a better quality life. I have to review that book because it's definitely not on my radar. Thank you very much for um, uh, recommending. I'm doing a copy paste and I'm saving it for the future. So thank you very much about that. No, I can't open it, but I saved it. Okay. Um, yeah. A, I don't know if it's AI or L, maybe it's L's. L Fox wrote that he or she would love uh, a warm up cool down webinar. So, no problem. <laughs> uh, Frederic, uh, how important is, is it to be officially diagnosed with EDS? I'm 42, post menopausal, and have always been hypermobile. I didn't see the other presentation. Sorry if it was covered there. Um, that's a great question that might be better to ask again to a physician who specializes in this because there are consequences of having a chronic illness. Um, for example, you want to travel abroad and you get to pay double the amount for your travel insurance because what if you have a flare and a doctor says, oh, you already been diagnosed with a chronic illness? Well, it's just your flare and they're not going to cover the injury related to your subluxation, just to name one. But at the same time, if it's serious, if it's needed medication, if it needs special a specialist to help you through other, um, get access to care, get access to support, it's extremely important. So it's hard to de de to determine this based on just looking at it. I I I very carefully guide my patients uh, for further diagnosis, especially when they're completely pain free their whole life and they just say wow okay I have hypermobility and I have zero impact and it's good to know I'm going to educate my children my grandchildren but I don't have any re symptoms related to it so I think this is a great conversation with your uh, primary care providers and specialists uh, Karen, I appreciate all the detail and decision-making factors you included. Thank you. Very helpful. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Erica, what is the difference between HEDS and classical EDS? Asking as a parenthesis, gen geneticists only order genetic testing for EDS, correct? If they suspect cardiovascular or classical EDS. So just wondering how classical EDS is more serious than the other. Cardiovascular EDS is more obvious than it's dangerous. So there's a spectrum of EDS categories, and I highly recommend for you to go on the Ehlers Danlos Society website. You can read it, Ehlers, uh, the, um, what's that name? Like the, <laughs> the line between, sorry, English is not my first language, EhlersDanlos.com, and you can read about uh, the differences. There's, there's quite a bit. Uh, HEDS does not have uh, a genetic background yet investigated, um, the classical EDS does have, and you can you can get diagnosed based on all the fourteen types that has been um, evaluated, and so I would recommend to read through that because it would be quite exhaust exhausted to list to go through all the fourteens and how they manifest. Obviously, uh, when I see somebody with lots of hypermobility and they they kind of somewhat 
check in most of the clinic criteria for HEDS, I still educate them that maybe it's not this type, maybe it's a, a classical EDS. Um, so it's something that that you can definitely check in and read more about. Um, I hope this was helpful answer. Robbie, just want to say thank you very much for the presentation. I will be making my appointment at your clinic as soon as I can and invaluable. Thank you very much, Robbie. I really appreciate your comment. Lori, thank you, Judith. I'm hoping you have space to take on new clients at your clinic. I have scoliosis and HEDS. I'm more than happy to see you as well. Uh, Liz, good points about the limitations on research. Yes, yeah, so um, same with scoliosis. There's there's a bunch of research we're missing out on. So the clinical expert expertise is much more valuable in those areas than the evidence-based medicine. And then in the center of the two, there's the patient value. So we really have, if I really have to rock your world to tell you that the evidence-based medicine says you have to do this, but you don't believe in that, what's the point of therapy? But, or same with, if the evidence-based medicine says to me that you have to do these exercises with EDS or with this with scoliosis, but me as a clinician, in my practice, I see it completely differently, I will let you know what my opinion, my expert experiences with a certain thing, and I will, and you can choose, okay, she is saying this, that's not supported by research, I don't wanna see her anymore. Or like, okay, she has some valuable, valuable, valuable um, points, I'm gonna to continue to see her because I understand that it's gonna be good for me. Um, so another question, Patricia, do you have advice on managing long COVID with HEDS? I used to be very active and I did not have fatigue. I was doing Pilates, TRX, Aquafit, biking, hiking, camping, long walks, lots of things, full-time uh, work. And now since COVID, I have ME, CFS, long COVID, POTS, MC, MCAS, and MCS. Uh, all I'm doing is bare minimum to get groceries and care for myself. I can tell that my muscle tone has gone away and I'm getting more HEDS joint issues as a result. So I'm very, very sorry that you're feeling this way. Been there, done that. For some of us, it takes months to recover. And for some people, it takes years. And maybe you're never going to get back to perfect state. I recently worked with a teenager who is part of the Olympic rowing team completely cutting her career into into an end because she couldn't get out of the, the long COVID misery. And um, it's not easy. And again, try not to focus on how to be more active, but more manage your symptoms with a physician, with a specialist, um, and use medical help because it's not gonna be, it's not, it's not an easy, easy task to tell you, start with five minutes of walk when you can barely stand up without feeling dizzy. So it's a little bit more fragile topic and I'm really sorry that you feel like you're slipping apart. I was couch bound for two months and could barely do my chart notes after I finished working. I had to work part time. So it was a very bumpy ride and there was quite a bit of a flare after Long, uh, contacting COVID and uh, it does get better and try to try to look around in in the research how what people are doing for long COVID and don't just feel like you have to put another exercise on your already tired body and two more cl clinics Lori asks is your clinic visit covered by MSB or private pay so every physiotherapist are uh, private but some people can qualify for MSP. Unfortunately, it's just a fraction of the price. So that, that could be checked at your uh, assessment. And the final question with Linda, what tools do you recommend for improving your posture? Is there a tool device for posture that can be worn while exercising? There's a lot of posture correctors on the internet, but it has to be a little bit more evaluated. What are they for? So if it's a very common one that just helps you to stay taller, so a little bit of those backpack style, strappy things those are never going to hurt you so give it a try they're relatively cheap but sometimes the best tools are uh, uh, custom made or custom after custom assessment okay so i hope this helps linda thank you very much for the questions i'm so proud of me myself that it's 4 30 and i answered all the questions <laughs> thanks judith that was a great presentation and 
I'm hoping that we can organize uh, Judith working more with my patients. So have a great day, everybody. Thank you.